On to number 17 on my best list and this is a book which is a fairly obscure book by a writer who is or was in his time quite famous, never had a bestseller, always critically acclaimed, very difficult man for people to get on with. In fact one of my hobbies as a sort of hardcore serious lifetime fan of British SF in particular is trying to get anecdotes about him out of um, friends and fans and writers and because I never met him sadly I always wanted to he's one of my idols and we're talking about Keith Roberts and this is Molly Zero which is one of his later books but Keith is best known for this book Pavan of which I have several copies this is a nice old panther one and yeah it probably is his best but as this is a subjective list I really want to talk about the book which I react to the most in his canon which is Molly Zero and Pavan's fascinating you know if you ever read just one Roberts you should read this it's an alternate history novel alongside Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle. It's regarded as the most important alternate history novel ever sort of published really. And it came out in 1966. It was first partially serialized, I think in Impulse magazine, which Keith was editor of. And it posits a world where the Armada succeeds, the Spanish Armada. Elizabeth I is assassinated and the Catholic Church, the Hispanic and Latinate Catholic Church dominates Europe for much, much longer. And it's set in 1966, and it was published in 1966. And the church has really slowed down the advance of science. And through a number of linked stories, Pavan means it's a kind of dance, like a folk dance. You see this wonderful image of a ruralized, not very scientific Britain, and how things are gradually starting to change. And the ending's really thoughtful, because you get Keith's own voice at the end. And it really is quite something. And Pavan was chosen by Anthony Burgess, the noted mainstream novelist, author of A Clockwork Orange, who wrote four science fiction novels, and critic Anthony Burgess as being one of the best 99 novels published in English since World War II. And that was in Burgess's book, 99 Novels. But I want to talk about Molly Zero, which came out in hardcover in 1980. This is the world first hardcover edition. And Keith, as I say, was a difficult man. He fell out with everybody. He fell out with publishers. He fell out with friends. He fell out with other writers. And he never married. He was very well known for his sympathetic portraits of young women. And Molly Zero, this the titular character of this book, is young and female. This is the paperback edition from Penguin. This is the first paperback, which came out in 1985. So it took five years to come out in paperback. And the reason for that was that Keith was so difficult that nobody wanted to work with him. Everybody knew he was a genius. But publishing a book by him was a minefield because he would explode about the, the artwork or the quality of the printing or what have you. The things which a lot of writers just have to shrug off Keith just wasn't very happy about. And he's a brilliant pro stylist. I think of him as the Thomas Hardy of science fiction. And his work is very tied up with the English landscape and ruralism. And he lived a lot in the sort of West Country, lived in the home counties, Wiltshire, Somerset, the sort of part of the, of the world I live in. And his work is just absolutely fantastic. He's like a cross between John Wyndham, John Christopher, J.G. Ballard. So he's very, very British, but his writing is just absolutely superb. And Molly Zero is set 200 years in the future. And there's been a limited sort of nuclear war. And Britain is under an authoritarian regime and it's divided up into different zones. Some of them are irradiated from bombs. Molly, as you see, has a number rather than a surname. And she's been raised in like dormitories with other young girls, the blocks they're called. And she's undergoing indoctrination and training to see where she's gonna fit in society because people are sort of picked up to, to put, sort of have different roles. Is she gonna be one of the elite? Is she gonna be like middle class? Is she gonna be one of the sort of masses or what have you? And the great thing about this book is this massive immediacy. And that's because it is written entirely in the second person present tense. So you are always in the central character's consciousness. So I'm just gonna read you the first few lines of chapter one. You're shivering inside your coat. It's a nice coat, brand new, an olive green mac. Belt cinched tight and collar turned up very military. It makes you look good, but it can't stop the shakes. You drive your fist deeper into the pockets and hunch your shoulders. You tell yourself there's nothing to worry about. It's only decentralization, it happens to everybody, but that doesn't help much either. You're Molly Zero and you're scared to death. The thing about Molly Zero is that even though it's an adult novel and it has adult content, it prefigures the wave of YA dystopian 
SF, which started really about 15 years ago. And it's sort of way, way ahead of that. And Keith did a book called Anita in about 1970, which is the stories of a teenage witch. And that prefigured the paranormal romance bloom, which came around in around about 19, let's see, when, when was it? So 2010. So he was way ahead of his time. And as I say, he's very good with his female characters. And you follow Maury's journey. So you're in her head all the time. Now, second person present tense is very immediate. Some people struggle to read it. And hardly anybody goes beyond a short story with it, but Keith does it through a whole novel. And this is another reason why I think it's his finest achievement. Pavan is probably richer in his world building and conception and his message. And this also has a wonderful ending in which the very last words, so don't jump forward to it, sort of really brings the punch home and makes the sort of coldness and harshness and also the sort of humanity of the book really come through. So that's Molly Zero. Um, as I say, five years till it came out in paperback. And you know, after this, I think his he really he really struggled. He had two short story collections also published by Golanx in that sort of late 70s, early 80s period. They never had mass market editions. His books have been out print for ages. He's too literary for, you know, a lot of SF readers who stick to space opera, but he's very rewarding and he should be a lot more well known. And had he not been such a difficult man, he would have been. All his later work is in small press editions. You can hear about that in my video on Kerosina, the definitive British small press. He also did a lot of work with Morrigan, um, with Les Escott, my friend who I've lost touch with, a great guy, great science fiction fan and collector. And Keith was very, very important. He was regarded by people like Priest, Moorcock, and dozens of others in the sort of British scene as being one of the most important SF writers of all time. He famously fell out with J.G. Ballard and it's very difficult to find out what actually happened when they had a clash over some of the directions that SF Impulse magazine was going in and nobody really will talk about this very much. Moorcock claims to have broken up what would have been a fight and what have you. So it's sort of epic stuff really. It really is part of the stuff of SF and Keith Roberts, for my money, one of the finest SF writers who ever lived. I keep talking about him on the channel. I haven't devoted a video to him and I've said this before and I'll say it again. It's because I need to get outside the film because his work is so tied up with the British landscape and it's really, really important stuff. And if you've never read Roberts, I urge you to take your time. If you like things like folk horror, you like his work, but he did have a scientific side. There's a lot about engineering in his books. You know, he was a man's man. He liked fast cars and he liked beer. Um, but as I say, he was a bachelor. So there was a kind of undercurrent of sadness in his work. Really fantastic stuff. Then we move on to a writer I talk about a lot on the channel and is somebody who I really revere. And it's weird because I try and try to pin down which is my favorite book by him. And I think it's probably The Book of Skulls. But this is the one which had the biggest impact on me on first reading, I would say. And this is Robert Silverberg, and this is A Time of Changes in the Golanx Classic SFB format. Um, this is from 1986. These were the precursors of the Masterworks, and this is number three in the series. They did about 25 of these before they were forced to shift down to the standard A format. That's an A format paperback because the specialist shops of the time had their racking and their bays set up just for A's because they did so many imports and the B format was uncommon in SF then. It's the, it's the sort of standard now. Won the Nebra Award, late 60s, early 70s. They're very much redolent of that time. And it's about personal pronouns. The interesting thing about this is that the central character of A Time of Changes comes from a planet where you're not allowed to say the word I. You cannot say I cross the room, I think this, I think that, because the ego is bad and the ego leads to destruction. And it's a fascinating thing because, of course, the whole pronoun thing, what you call people, what they call you, is very much on the agenda now. I personally am not that bothered about it myself. Um, but it's, it's a sort of big issue in this. And when the narrator and central character goes to another planet where people say I all the time, he's really sort of shocked. It's, it's you know, it, it's bad. It's not just bad form. It's a real taboo. But he also gets involved with some sort of political intrigue there and he ends up taking a drug which opens up his consciousness and changes him and as it's all in the title a time of changes and it reflects what was happening in america and western society generally then the fact that people were going through a change of consciousness they were thinking differently about things they were thinking about asserting their individuality and not accepting authority they were thinking about how if only people could 
you know, be liberated from their narrow ways of thinking that they would see different ways of life and different ways of doing things that would be better for everybody. So it's really important. It's got that wonderful silvery prose and it's all in the name, you know, it's that beautiful silvery prose and muscular construction. There's no fat on the work. And Silverberg is also like an iceberg. He's implacable. You know, his work descends on you and it's massive and you just see the tip of it. And the power is there and the majesty of his prose is just really quite something and I put this up there with his other key works which I would say this one dying inside the book of skulls downward to the earth tower of glass man in the maze they're my favorites this is one of the biggest impact on me I'm about to reread it actually for the first time in quite some time because I've managed to acquire an Eastern Press leather bound edition which um, I haven't received yet that's an order at the moment I've wanted one for a while and it really is quite something and it's back in print from Golag's Masterworks after being decades in the wilderness and it's a little discussed one it is a book of his time but because of the whole fat focus on language and linguist linguistics and language are important in SF because science fiction is books it's words before it's anything so it's cardinally important and it's absolutely wonderful and all the classic Silverberg themes I always talk about power transcendence transformation and redemption and sometimes shock and destruction are there as well a time of changes this is somebody this is hard because this is somebody who wrote about a hundred books I've read 40 odd I think and he wrote all sorts of things and I could have picked any number of them I was going to leave him out but he was really really key and because he's in a tradition he's in the lit British literary SF tradition he predates the new wave so he's very important if you like people like Wells, Orwell, Wyndham, what have you. That's Brian Aldiss. And Brian Aldiss, a great guy. I met him a couple of times. He could write all sorts of SF. He was an SF scholar, great anthologist, novelist, poet. And I picked this book because it takes one of the sort of old tropes from the golden age and twists it and is really a bravura performance of technique and how technically you construct a science fiction novel. And that's non-stop. Okay, non-stop. Non-stop is a Generation Starship novel. Generation Starship is the idea about if we have to colonize distant planets and we can't conquer the whole sort of faster than light thing, the FTL thing, you then have to send people off in ships and they live on board all their life. They have children, their children live on board all their lives and they have children, what have you. And the classic one is Orphans of the Sky by Robert Heinlein, which was fixed up out of two short stories from Astounding. And it wasn't the first one. There was one before that in the early 30s and I can't think who it was by, but this is the best one. And what this does this has a double quantum punch in it. It has paradigm shift. It has conceptual breakthrough. It has conceptual breakthrough again. And it's also very flavoursome. The ship, um, the, the characters don't know they're on board a ship. This is the classic thing in Generation Starship things. And it's all sort of full of hydroponic plants and there are giant rats and conflicts between people and the central character Roy complain Roy complain and he does complain he's this sort of like irritating wheezy little guy and all this is one of the first people to show me that you didn't have to have sympathetic characters in SF you could have unsympathetic characters and it's just wonderful I could have picked any number of other ones Frankenstein Unbound looms large as does Hothouse probably the most imaginative book I've ever read Another one that comes up is Greybeard, which is a, a book which is, if you've seen The Children of Men or The Children of Men, Greybeard is like that, but decades before, much, much better um, and very beautiful. And yeah, all this, he, he really was something special. So this is, this is great, kinetic, exciting stuff, full of mystery and revelation. And, you know, it's a fleet read. It'll keep you going. And really, all this at his best was insightful and fierce. And, you know, and, and his prose is just so fine. It really is fantastic and great entertainment really makes you think as well. And the climaxes of this book really are at the heart of what makes for truly great SF. They also explain why, when you've read this, why no good writer ever needs to do a series. Because in SF, it's all about the singleton, the short story of the novel with the novum at the beginning, the paradigm shift, and at the end, the conceptual breakthrough or two or three. And this is one of the finest examples of that. That's nonstop. Number 14. So we're sort of counting down. And the, the author I picked here, I've gone for a short story collection because I couldn't leave him out because I think he's so good. 
and yet probably only about 40% of his output is SF. He also writes fantasy. He basically writes things that you can't categorize a lot of the time. And he recently won a prize for pushing the boundaries of fiction, showing the boundaries of what fiction could do. And he emerged in the late 1960s in New World's magazine as the literary editor and as a critic. And we're talking about M. John Harrison. M. John Harrison is one of my three favorite living writers. I'll be interviewing him on the channel in about a month's time. I haven't seen him for a few years. He's a great guy. We've had various encounters over the years, done events together. He signed loads of books for me, he stayed at my house once and really sort of amazing guy. And I wanted to pick something by Mike because he really is something very special. Now, probably his purest SF novel is The Centauri Device, which is a dark British space opera that came out in the mid seventies. It's very ornate and Baroque, very besteran. Um, and you'd love it if you like things like Ian Baggs and Alistair Reynolds, except the writing is far, far better. It's a lot more, how can I say? It's a lot more, it's verbose, but it's more eloquent as well. It's more, architectural, it's more transformative and it's more mind bending and outre. So Harrison's a really important writer and I really wanted to put him in and this is where we get our first short story collection and this is my favourite work by him. He's still busy now doing all sorts of stuff but I wanted to pick this collection which is called The Ice Monkey. Even though much of Mike's SF, most of it is in the early part of his career, he did a trilogy towards the end of the 90s, early part of the century, which began with a book called Light, which really divides people, but that Ian Banks thought was brilliant. This is uh, my favorite book by him. This is The Ice Monkey, and this is the Golang's hardcover first edition, and this is the Unwin A format paperback. I'm not sure if you can get this at the moment. Some of these stories pop up in a collection called Settling the World, and let's have a look. And this one is signed. That one's signed as well, probably, you could say we've met many times. I do have to send him some book plates, though, to sign a few things for me, which I don't have signed. I'm not likely to see him for a while, so there you go. And I heard, M. John Harrison read the title story of this um, one night at the World Con in 1987 in Brighton and I have never ever heard any writer read a story as well as Harrison and I've heard world famous people. Mike is the best reader to a live audience I've ever ever heard. And the Ice Monkey isn't a science fiction story, it's actually more like a ghost story, but I'm not going to tell you. There are science fiction stories in here, most notably Running Down, which is a key new wave story. It doesn't appear till late in the new wave, sort of mid 70s, and it's about a man who is the physical embodiment of entropy. And it's entropy is really important in new wave science fiction about things running down the law of thermodynamics where ordered systems tend towards chaos over time as you'll find i find that here in the in the hideout things just go all over the place but there's stories like the new rays settling the world the quarry there's a wonderful story called Egnaro, which is about a second-hand bookseller who just seems to be seeping into a strange other world. And the thing about these is they're very realistic. The characters are recognizable. They're not archetypes, but they are fully rounded characters. The prose, he's almost like, if you imagined a science fiction Alan Bennett, but a cool one with great observational things, great textural things. And Mike is just amazing. The stories, they leap off the page and you just feel the character's feelings. And they're often sort of, scrubby run down there's people with problems and all the sort of stuff and texture and dirty gritty little detail of life is in these and he, he could write anything something he hasn't is wrote a crime novel you wrote a crime novel would be incredible um but he's also very good at you know he can really pull out the stops if you read light and his space operas it's very much like show me you think you can write space opera think again they're dark and they're gothic and they're full of high weirdness but the, it's the textual quality of the prose and mike's whole thing is about he takes you puts you in a landscape and you've got to work it out he's not going to infer dump things so he's not going to make it easy for you he's going to challenge you and he's going to sort of really say to you look the world is strange the universe is strange things are not as simple as we as we think they are we've all got to work our own way through them and this is what you can do in my story and that's what he does with the ice monkey and the ice monkey itself says so ma magnificent magnificent Egnaro is magnificent and the pure sf stories in here as well there's a couple which are kind of supernatural horror so this is a cross genre thing but mike's that sort of writer and with new wave writers that's the important thing part of their jam was very much to 
pull SF back towards the mainstream and to er erode the line between them and take SF out the ghetto and let it infect the mainstream and turn the mainstream novel around and stop it being the dull family social dramas, stop it being like Dickens and what have you, and brought it screaming into the modern world where technology and the media landscape was affecting people. And Mike's very much part of that. And he does it in really, really clever ways. And he's quietly very witty as well. So that's M. John Harrison, The Ice Monkey. Don't miss it. Don't miss any of his work. It's sublime. Okay, so moving on. We're looking now at number 13, and it's a kind of opposite number really for the person I want to talk about. And this is somebody I got into at the end of my teens, and he was a major figure in British counterculture. He was involved with rock and roll bands. He was involved with this band. Um, he edited New Worlds magazine in the 1960s and 70s. He wrote heroic fantasy sword and sorcery novels. He wrote some SF. He could write anything. The guy's an absolute genius. And he, his name looms large and he wrote a lot of books very quickly as entertainment to keep New Worlds magazine going, which was a magazine which was all about experimental SF and moving that into a broader milieu in countercultural society. But he also wrote a small amount of SF and a book which is very dear to my heart. And this wasn't the first copy I bought. The first copy I bought was a paperback, which I no longer have. Um, but I remember going into a bookshop in Cardiff and I ordered this book in hardcover. It was the first book I ever ordered, especially in my life. And it was the first book I, I ordered in hardcover as well. And it took quite a long time to come. And I ended up working in that bookshop a year later. And that's Michael Moorcock's The Final Program. And this is the Alison and Busby reissue from the late 70s. And this is the first of, well, there's eight, maybe 10. There's short stories, there's novels. There's, there's, there are a very loose series about a character called Jerry Cornelius, who is a Nobel Prize winning physicist, a rock star, a former Jesuit priest, an assassin and an agent of chaos. And this is the Alison and Busby UK first edition, world first edition of the final programme, which was initially published as a serial in New Worlds magazine. And there's Michael Moorcock on the back there. And Jerry is rather like if you imagine a cool version of Austin Powers in the 1960s when the Bond films first came along there were lots of pastiches and they tried to sort of merge them with people wearing car coats and frock coats and what have you and being a bit hippie and a bit cool and psychedelic and these are kind of a parody of that and Jerry he lives in the near future or maybe the 1960s and as he's an agent of chaos and what he does he changes sides constantly there's a lot of political turmoil in these. There's a lot of sort of military stuff going on. There's a lot of commentary certainly on the Vietnam War and you never really know what's going on in these books. But in the final program, which is the most conventional one, and then things fall apart as entropy comes in. Jerry um, has been exiled from his home for many years for having an incestuous relationship with his sister Catherine. And he wants to get back home to rescue her because his brother Frank has her in a drug-induced stupor. So the structure is rather like the early Elric and Mel Libane stories with Elric and Workoon. So if you like that sort of thing, you love this. And Jerry really gets involved with this cabal of scientists and a woman called Miss Brenner, who's the lady with the red hair, who is a computer programmer and rather conservative type. And she has this idea that the world is ending. And the only way to survive it is to create a perfect being, a hermaphroditic being, which can self-fertilize, self-reproduce, which also has all the world's knowledge in its brain downloaded from computers. So that's basically what the book is about. And more than that happens. And it's very funny and sexy. There's a lot of references to rock and roll and contemporary things. It's very cool. It's quite camp in parts. And really this was the countercultural SF novel, you know, of all time probably and Jerry is very sort of amusing later on he gets older he falls out of favor he has a rock band called the deep fix and it could well be that all of this is just in the head of Jerry Cornelius as he grows up in Ladbroke Grove in London in the um, late 50s and early 60s so it could just all be a dream or not but they're non-linear they're fascinating they're funny um, and the later ones they do become rather mannered but the final program is a book to read when you're young and hip and I used to go around dressed like Jerry Cornelius I would wear black and white and I had long dark hair like him so it's a huge influence on me and you know if you want the sort of fun side of the new wave this is very much the way to go and also Moorcock would encourage other writers to write stories in Cornelius's milieu and use the characters use the situations and James Salas did it um, 
M. John Harrison did it, Maxim Jakubowski, Brian Aldiss, loads of people wrote Cornelius stories. So, you know, they become part of the weft and weave of new wave science fiction. The final programme, fantastic stuff. I love it. Then we come to another book about adolescence, um, a famous book and a book with a amazing, amazing structure, which really is a book about language as much as anything else. It's also a book about free will and if you're doing something wrong, is it wrong to stop somebody from being bad, to force them to be good? And that book is A Clockwork Orange. And that's my penguin from the late 70s, early 80s. This is a sort of sixth or seventh reprint, which Burgess himself signed for me. A Clockwork Orange, of course, was made into a famous film. And is set in the near future when there are astronauts in space and right-wing governments on Earth is set in a welfare state. And it's about a young hooligan called Alex, who's only 14, who has a street gang. They go out at night. He hardly ever goes to school. They take drugs, which are now legalized. They rob, beat people up. There's rape and murder. And he ends up in prison and he is subject to something called the Ludovico technique, which is a form of brainwashing designed to make him good. So it's all about important issues in politics, in free will, whether it's right, you know, to sort of oppress people and to make them do things they don't want to do. Is that actually worse than somebody who is just a street thug? It's also very witty. The language is really clever. It's written in the teenage Argo NADSAT, the language of the not too distant future, which is a little bit of Slavic sort of Russian words and what have you, but it's actually very easy to read. And it's just wonderful. Again, it's a wonderful book to read when you're young. It's about being full of ire and fire and full of seed and wanting to go out there and confront the world and sometimes do bad things. And it's also a book about growing up. It's got heavy symbolic value because there's 21 chapters and the 21st chapter, which is missing from many American editions, has important symbolic value. And Clockwork Orange is one of the finest dystopian novels I've ever read. It's really, really important. Burgess wrote about four science fiction novels. Some critics think he didn't, but he did. He wrote four. So this one, though, is the one you must read. It's a Penguin Modern Classic. You really find it in science fiction sections. But is it S? you betcha. Then we come on to another classic, um, the oldest book on my list and a book which had a massive impact. It needs no introduction. I'm just going to go straight into it because everybody should of it. You must read it and that is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. But this is Frankenstein the 1818 text. Funnily enough this recent puffin cloth bound hardcover is the 1818 text. This is my Oxford paperback of the 1818 text. For many years, you couldn't get the 1818 text. What am I talking about? Well, Frankenstein was revised significantly in 1831 and reissued. And most people, most editions out there, the 1831 edition. Now, when she wrote this, Percy Shelley, um, the poet, her husband, her man, Percy Bysshe Shelley, he wrote about five to eight percent of this. It's in his hand. The manuscript exists. So he edited, rewrote, corrected and a lot of the ideas came from Shelley and Byron um, and she expanded on them. Not to sort of denigrate her achievement at all but this is the classic story of you know the business of the future being dangerous again of man creating something in his pride and hubris and not really taking responsibility for it. So it is sort of like proto Michael Crichton where, you know, be careful with science because it'll turn around and bite you in the ass. And this is very much the thing. It's also a metaphor for child neglect and cruelty. And it's a book which requires a huge sort of discussion. There is something on it on the channel about it's called, let's see, Mary Shelley was never cancelled. Frankenstein, Cyberpunk and the Sublime. So I talk about it there. So if you haven't read Frankenstein or if you have read it, get a copy of the 1818 text and read that because you get to read it then in its original edition and it's more scurrilous, it's more anti-religious, it's more inflammatory than the later version and I prefer it and it's sort of more clipped and harsh and Frankenstein the 1818 text. That is where modern science fiction begins as far as I'm concerned. Um, a lot of critics say this, Brian Aldiss was a person who sort of really put it on board and there is this nonsense around the internet that you know Mary Shelley was cancelled and that you know it was all a woman created science 
science fiction, you know, nobody wants to talk about it. Well, men were talking about that very fact decades and decades and decades ago. So make sure you get that right. So Frankenstein, the 1818 text, seminal stuff and the oldest book on this list. Then another classic. Well, what can we say? Um, this for me was the last truly great Piwa SF novel. Um, I read it when it first came out in paperback, which was in 1986. Was it 1986? It came out in paperback in the UK in 86. It was a paperback original in the USA in 84 and it was an ace book. So the world, true world first edition is the ace paperback. And it's a book which changed everything. It's a book which created the world we live in. And it needs very little introduction. And that is William Gibson's Neuromancer. This is my, the first paperback edition I bought. This is the UK and world hardcover first. Only 500 of these are printed. Both of these are signed by Gibson. And the original and only full on cyberpunk novel. I'm not really going to say anything else about it because so much has already been said. But if you read only one science fiction novel from the 1980s, you should probably read this. If you're not a science fiction reader and you want to understand the state of the art and it's still the state of the art, you read this. It's a book which has everything. I read it every year and every time I come over something different. It's a crime story. It's a love story. It's a story of transcendence. Basically, it's set in a future where there is the consensual hallucination of cyberspace, the internet. The internet wasn't even invented when this was written. We live in a world where the corporations rule, governments seem to have no power. You're not sure when this is set. I would say 2050, 2070. And the central character case is somebody, a young man who's basically a criminal. He's earned his living stealing data and selling it to other corporations stealing from one, selling to another, and he pretty much betrays his fence-like employers, and he ends up losing his talent, but there's a chance for him to have it back, but he has to work for an AI called Wintermute, and it's absolutely magnificent stuff. There's wonderful set pieces. There's a magnificent section set in space. It's a labyrinthine narrative. It, it's prose glitters. It's like Dick, Delaney and Silverberg thrown together. Flashes of Alfred Bester. You know, it's one of those books. It's just all hyperbole. You just have to read it and sink into it. There's an awful lot to it. And as I say, I guess I'm indifferent about it every single time I read it. It's so rich and it's a wonderful dystopian novel, a critique of the world that we now live in, the world we were heading towards and the world that we will end up in. The future will be more like this than anything else you will read. And that's the guarantee, William Gibson, New Romancer. The youngest book on this list, I'm afraid to say. And as I say, after this, you know, there's other things, but nobody really seemed to exceed this for his flash and his fire and his speed. It's just impeccable. It's the ultimate sort of core. It's transformative. It's majestic. It's the very pinnacle of genre SF. And I don't think genre SF has been the same since. So if you only ever read one genre SF novel, you read New Romancer. OK, we then come on to somebody who was a precursor of Gibson, probably, you know, one of the most important writers in the history of genre SF, somebody who started writing the late 30s for the magazines. And he's very well known for his two early novels, his two early science fiction novels, his first novel and his third novel. His second novel was a mainstream thriller called Who He, aka The Rat Race. His first novel was the first ever winner of the Hugo Award for Science Fiction, The Demolished Man. And his third novel is you know, arguably one of the greatest genre SF novels ever. But I haven't picked that. I've not picked Tiger Tiger, aka The Star's My Destination. I've picked another book by this writer, and the writer is Alfred Bester. And I've picked the book because I think he was better at short forms. And this is The Dark Side of the Earth which is one of my favorite collections of SF stories ever. There are seven stories in it. It's witty, it's flashy, it has experimental prose techniques. It's sort of wisecracking and quick witted, it's stylish. And above all, it's absolutely fizzes with energy. And Bester, you know, he thought John W. Campbell was a net, you know, and this guy, he influenced everybody from Moorcock to William Gibson to Delaney, 
Carl and Allison, everybody. It's sheer style and bravura. You know, this is a guy who left all his money to his barman when he died. He was a magazine editor. You know, he, he abandoned SF for decades to edit a flashy travel magazine. You know, he could do anything. He could write anything. And he was just ahead of everyone else. This was the guy who really brought literary quality into science fiction in the genre sense, into the ghetto of SF. The only person before him, I think, who really did a lot of work in that area. I was Henry Cutner and C.L. Moore, arguably Theodore Sturgeon, Ray Bradbury. You know, Bester is a stylist above all, but he also tells a cracking tale. There's a story in here called The Pie Man, which to me influences one of the key things. I, when I read The Pie Man, and it's pie, the mathematical equation, I think of loads of things from New Wave SF, especially in Britain, M. John Harris and Michael Moorcock. You know, all those things, really, really amazing performance and very funny as well. Really witty and, and great, great stuff. And there are seven stories in here and they're absolutely perfect. There's a post-apocalyptic story called They Don't Make a Life Like They Used To from the early 60s. There's a wonderful story of revenge and ire called Time is the Traitor. There's a really funny time travel revenge story called The Men Who Murdered Muhammad. And it's just, and it's, you know, no critique of Islam in there, but I should say absolutely fantastic. Best uh, Dark Side of the Earth. Best thing he did. You can get these stories in other collections, but what I find is these, I think, are his finest stories. And if they're mixed up with others, you lose some of the impact. So try and get this. This should be in print always. And it's never been in print in the time I've been selling books, which is nearly 40 years. And boy, does that give me pain but you can pick it up without too much difficulty. The Dark Side of the Earth. There is a video about it on the channel. Boy, would I love a hardcover. It's in an omnibus, a Cedric omnibus. Right, then we move on to another writer who, again, I think he, he's not, he is well known. He's not as well known as he should be, not anymore. Because again, he fundamentally wrote short stories. He wrote some novels. They're mostly early in his career. They're not amongst his best work. He was primarily a screenwriter. He wrote a lot of fantasy, and I don't mean sword and sorcery, I mean fantasy in the wide sense and horror. He wrote all sorts of things, journalism, but he wrote amazing SF. And from about 1959 until the early to mid seventies, he produced his finest work. And his finest work is nearly all genre SF. He mostly wrote in short forms. He was fierce, savage, divisive, but his prose was just absolutely magnificent, magnificent, sublime. He was an angry man. He was never, a, he was never a happy. He was a happy man. There was a lot of joy in his work, but really he was somebody who was on fire. He was a little guy, but he had lots of balls. And I'm not sure if I'd have liked him if I'd known him as a person, but boy, I love his work. And this is his finest book. Again, see if you can get this one. See if you can get the UK edition, the American edition has slightly different content. It's got the other stuff in it is great and would fit in this. So don't be afraid to get that. But if you get the British one, if you can. And again, this is a book which has only been in print on demand edition for years. And it's a disgrace. But again, he was very difficult and his publishers would fall out with him all the time. And that's Harlan Ellison. And that's the beast that shouted love at the heart of the world. And that's a depiction of the title story. Um, I say the title story, the longer story in here, the Nebula award winning novella, A Boy and His Dog, which is the ultimate post apocalypse story like no other. I did think of putting The Road by Cormac McCarthy into this list, which is a book I really love and I think it's amazing. I read it in one sitting. I think it's the finest post-apocalyptic novel ever, but the finest post-apocalyptic story per se is the one in The Beast That Shouted Love at the Heart of the World, and that is A Boy and His Dog. For A Boy and His Dog alone, I would put this book in my top sort of 15. And this, where, where are we? We're at, we're at number eight, I believe. And the other stories in here as well. There's a video about this on the channel as well, so I won't talk about it too much. But these are some of the finest genre SF stories I've ever read. You know, alien beings, alien invasion, military futures, surrealism, post-apocalyptic landscapes. You know, it's just all in here. It really, really is. All the tropes, all the sort of symbols, all the cliches, all here, spun around in a centrifuge and they spark and set the world alight. A boy and his dog is the key one. A boy and his dog inspired the song Dave, Diamond Dogs by David Bowie. Not a lot of people know that, but it's obvious to me. And yeah, absolutely great. If you like it hard and fast and savage and glittering and shiny and 
with a sort of abrasive quality. They're still heartfelt and angry and cares about things. Then Alison is the one to go for. The beast that shouted love at the heart of the world. And boy, what a title it is. Short stories. Then a book which isn't a novel. And it's not a short story collection either. But it's important because this person was a writer. I believe there are a handful of people who work in extracurricular medium in SF who don't work in who don't work in prose fiction or poetry who are really important SF writers. One of them is David Cronenberg. The other one who is more seminal because he comes earlier and he started his career as a writer as a writer of prose fiction and he won the Somerset Maugham Award for the short story collection in the early 50s called Tomato Cane um, and we're talking about Nigel Neal and this is Quatermass and the Pit. This is a teleplay this was a TV series around about 1960, the third of four series about a scientist called Quatermass, who's a rocket um, and scientist and cosmologist, astronomer, and a pioneer of space travel. And Quatermass and the Pit scared me to death. There is a film version from Hammer. There's a BBC TV serial in black and white, which you can still get. You can get it on Blu-ray these days, and it's in really good shape. And this is the book, Neil, really was amazing. What he did, he managed to get the gothic feel of classic ghost stories, the sort of M.R. James thing, R.T.C. Rolt thing, with a little bit of the sort of Lovecraftian thing, and he'd merge it with space age concerns. And Quake the Mass is a troubled scientist, a rocket engineer, as I say, who's trying to get Britain into the space age. And this is in the 1950s. But he keeps coming up against alien intelligences, which are trying to invade the Earth. So in all four stories, there's a different threat of invasion and this time it's from within and it begins with the discovery and this is set, it's set in 1959 there's a new tube station being dug in the east end of London and when the engineers are digging down they come across some fossils of primitive men but they don't quite fit or do they fit into the sort of known lineage of the hominid family tree and then Beneath that level, something else is found, a large hull of what could be a bomb, but could also be a spaceship, a spaceship from Mars, Quatermass and the Pit. Nobody ever frightened me as much as Neil. He terrified me. He had a long career in screenwriting for television and film, and there's just something completely infernal about his work. His ideas are just so frightening. They get under your skin. John Carpenter is massively influenced by him. Prince of Darkness is massively influenced by Nigel Neal. And he's just incredible ideas. And, and, and that one, he really racked it up. The first one was scary. The second one was like one of the sort of taproot texts of the sort of modern zombie thriller, Quatermass 2. And Quatermass in the Pit pushed it even further. And then you get to the fourth one, which is just called Quatermass, a.k.a. the Quatermass Conclusion. And that, oh man, it's, this is this is the real horror. And yet pure science fiction, magnificent stuff. There, there really is nothing as infernal as the imagination of Nigel Neal. Sublime. Right, we're heading up now to the last six. And again, a famous book, a favourite book. I can't really make any apologies for it. It was really hard because this person wrote so much. They wrote at least a dozen masterpieces in a career that spanned 50 books, five wives, dead at 52. You know what I'm talking about. And I'm talking about Philip K. Dick. And it was very, very hard because in a way I wanted to pick a lesser known Dick. But in the end, I had to go for the first one I read, the one which changed my life which changed my view of what science fiction could be. So we're talking about Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. That's the copy I bought in 1976 in pont de -Preeth, South Wales. And it's uh, Panther Granada. There you go. And I came across that in the rack of the news agent John Menzies. And I was been reading SF for some years and I'd started a branch out into the Americans. And I found that Asimov and Heinlein just weren't doing it for me. They just they just seem really clunky. Um, Heinlein seemed really prurient. Asimov, the robot stories, they just, just weren't working for me. And then I saw this and the sheer strangeness of the title, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? I went for it and it changed my life forever. And 
it set the standard for me of what American literary SF should be. Now, obviously, everybody knows this film is Blade Runner. Let's forget the film. The book is so much better, so much more important, so much broader. And I love Blade Runner. Don't get me wrong. It's one day in the life of an ordinary man in the future. But it's a future where there's been World War Terminus, the Third World War, or maybe the Fourth. And it's irradiated. People are leaving Earth for colonies on Mars and elsewhere where life is better. But if you become irradiated to a certain degree, you can't. When you go off world, there are androids, slave androids, and they're illegal on Earth. The central character of this Rick Deckard, he has one day in which to kill six rogue androids which have come to Earth. If he can kill all six androids, he has a salary, but he's like a bounty hunter. He will get enough money to buy a real animal because his pet is electric. It's a fake sheep. It's not a real one. And in this future world, because animals have gradually become extinct and are rare and certain animals have gone all together, like owls have gone all together, they revered and people realize what they've lost. So to own an animal and to care for an animal and to show empathy towards something which is non-human is one of the highest things. And this is something in the novel, which it is in the film, but it's more in the novel. There's a religion called Mercerism, which isn't in the film at all. And it's about a prophet called Wilbur Mercer, who said that the humble things were important. So it's just one day in the life of an ordinary man in the future. And when I read it as a kid, I sort of picked it up and it begins with the character waking up in bed with his wife and they have an argument straight away. And the argument is partially sparked by a piece of tech, the Penfield mood organ, which electrically stimulates the brain. And Penfield is a real guy. He did research into, um, into electrical stimulation of the brain. And it begins with this couple who are partially estranged and they need the status symbol of a real animal to care for. And it's just one day in the life of ordinary people. And it's full of sympathy and strangeness. There's some generally weird stuff in here. It's got the religion. It's really well re realized. There's a TV show with a TV star who's on it 24 hours a day. He can't be real. There's lots of questions about what's real and what's not, mostly around empathy and how you tell the difference between a humanoid machine and a human being. And it's very wise. It's got lots of characters, marvelous Gordian not planning. It does make you think. I go back to it time and time again, and it's just absolutely magnificent. On the back of this book, there are two quotes which appeared on dick books for decades and decades. And they're quotes which were sort of from round about the time this was written, which was the late 60s. And John Brenner said, the most consistently brilliant SF writer in the world. And Michael Moorcock said, Dick is quietly producing serious fiction in a popular form, and there could be no greater praise. Absolutely. Philip K. Dick was made famous after he died by Blade Runner. Before that, nobody cared, apart from a handful of critics, science fiction writers, and the French and the English. Nobody cared before that. I firmly believe that without Blade Runner, Philip K. Dick would never have been canonised. Now, everybody's interested in his religious experiences, his philosophical significance, what have you. And in a way, he's been a block. He's prevented writers like Delaney, Dish, Ellison, Malzberg from being accepted, Silverberg from being accepted into the canon of mainstream literature as well. Because, oh, we've let one American SF writer, and we've let one guy in, that's absolutely fine. We've let Philip K. Dick in, we can't let the rest in, we don't need them. We wouldn't even bother to read their work. And that's a mistake, but you have to read Dick. He's central, he's really important. He has a tone like nobody else. His way of dealing with multiple characters. He's pretty much always third person, very rarely first person. It's right like Charles Dickens or Mick Heron or anybody who was really good at that ensemble cast thing. Dick is on it and he's very clear ideas about good and evil. It's absolutely fantastic stuff. So to understand of Electric Sheep, forget Blade Runner, read the book, immerse yourself in its wonderful world, the world building. Just astonishing. So good. And it all takes place in one day. What a performance. Structurally sublime, even when it goes into the really weird stuff. Top five. Well, he should be number one, really, because without him, we wouldn't be here. And, you know, without him, would any of us be here doing this sort of thing, reading these sort of books? And, you know, there, there were people before him. Um, they're important. They're not as important. He had a long career. He wrote an awful lot. Really, it's the early work in the first 10 years is what's significant. This was his first book. He wrote different versions of it over many years. He was writing in a period of enormous social change. He had interesting ideas about the way the world should go. He 
you know, had a negative side. He was a womanizer. He believed in world government. He famously fell out with, with, with other writers. Um, but he was a massively famous and influential person. He was a man who really brought the future onto the plate. At the end of the 19th and the early 20th century, he was a socialist. We're talking about H.G. Wells, and this is The Time Machine, his first novel. This is my only copy of The Time Machine. I'd love a decent hardcover. Can I find a decent hardcover just to The Time Machine? No, I can't. And I've read and read and read this. As you see, it's short, it's very fleet, and Basically, time travel is one of the most common motifs in genre SF. Wells, first and best. His time traveller doesn't go a thousand years into the past, two thousand years into the future. He goes eight hundred thousand years into the future. And it's a metaphor for the social conditions of the time. He sees a world which is divided into an effete, lazy, genteel species called the Eloi. But there is something living underground, something which has been pushed there by the rich and the wealthy, and it has changed and it has come back different. The Morlocks, the time machine. And not just that, that narrative which everybody knows so well, there's also the magnificent closing section where the time traveller goes further into the future. And there's a vision of apocalyptic strangeness and colour and weirdness, which is one of the grimmest and most alien things you'll ever read. It must have influenced so many people, the time machine. Um, Wells, I mean, War of the Worlds is seminal. The Island of Dr. Moreau is more important than anybody gives a credence for these days. The Invisible Man is the one I'm less keen on, but The Sleeper Awakes is important. There's lots of other ones, Food of the Gods, all seminal. And Wells, of course, he wrote really beautifully. He wrote social novels as well. Anne Veronica, The New Machiavelli, great books. And, you know, this is the guy who made science fiction or the scientific romance, as he called it, part of British literary culture, not just as a one off, because everybody wrote an SF novel. Trollope wrote one. I've got, I've got a book over there by Joseph Conrad and Ford Maddox Ford, which is a science fiction novel. And, you know, everybody had to go there. It was just part of what people did. But Wells made it his thing and he laid the groundwork for good or for ill for literary SF in the UK and for genre science fiction in the American magazines. Absolutely fantastic. If you all never read one Wells and if you read your first Wells, this should be the first one. I saw a YouTube video the other day by somebody who's been on YouTube for years doing SF videos and she said she'd only just read this and I couldn't believe it. This is as seminal as it gets. You know, you should start here for beginners, the time machine. That's where it all began. Okay, then on to a writer who I can't really be um, objective about because he was he was my first great love. If I can find, if I can find um, one of his books, and this was somebody I read everything. Um, I'd I read it. I'd read it all by the time I was about thirteen, and things got reissued. And he had a career which was cut short. He was relatively young when he died. He was very English. He was very home counties. He was a very private man. He was a wonderful pro stylist. He often gets called the cosy catastrophist based on what something that um, Brian Aldiss said. I don't think so. I think there was a hard, dark, cold core at the centre of this guy's writing. And we're talking about John Wyndham, and this is the Midwich Cuckoos, his finest achievement. People talk about Day of the Triffids. Triffids is great. It's unforgettable. The Crake and Wakes, not quite so much. The Chrysalids, wonderful book to read if you're a teenager. Magnificent post-apocalyptic, post-nuclear thing about mutants. This, though, is the one. The Midwich Cuckoos. An English village. Rural, quiet, serene. Nothing's happened there for centuries. Then one day, everyone falls asleep. Nobody can enter. Then everybody wakes up. A few months later, they realise that all the women of childbearing age are pregnant. It's an alien invasion by proxy, by a gestalt entity. And at the centre of it is Gordon Zellaby, a philosopher and writer. He is the mouthpiece. And basically, it's a book about Darwinian struggle, about survival, survival of the fittest. What is it right to do when you're human and you're a moral sense? Is it right to kill something that looks like you, that might be more superior to you, but also is going to supplant you? What do you do in the jungle to survive? And Wyndham really wrote a lot about social Darwinism. It was one of his key things. He wrote sort of lighter things as well. And, you know, he wrote very, lots of very important books, but this was a key thing, survival. And it came at a time after World War II when people 
had gone through a lot in Britain. There was rationing for years afterwards and things were starting to change politically. People got fed up with the old order. But at the same time, there were concerns about nuclear weapons and what was happening with the Cold War. There were also concerns about the loss of the sort of colonial history of Britain and things were changing and the young were emerging and the young were different. And the Midwich Cuckoos encapsulates all these things. But more importantly, it is about that moral question. When things change and as they change in the world, we're cha the world is changing all the time, but it's the change is getting rapid and it's happening. What do you do if you're about to be supplanted by something else, by someone else? Survival. It's a very powerful thing. Does it override? Is it morally right to let yourself be ground down and destroyed? What do you do when the invader comes? And it's absolutely magnificent. This is his best written book as well, I think, and it, it has all his major themes. There's recently a terrible TV series where people didn't understand. It's also a comment on the Nazis, on this whole idea of a master race of Aryan supermen who all look the same. It's so obvious. And he did that in a book which wasn't published at the time from a few years earlier called Plan for Chaos, which is now available. He was doing it in that as well. It didn't quite come off so well. This is absolutely fantastic. Wyndham, it cannot be denied how important it is. He influenced everybody. Even the people who professed to hate him, worshipped him, Ballard, Priest, you know, I mean, they they, they liked him. I think Ballard probably, you know, was, was a little bit more circumstantial about it. But he invented, you know, the whole the whole English catastrophe novel had already been there, but Wyndham sort of crystallised it and made it his own and wrote it best. People say Christopher was a bit sharper, John Christopher, but no, Wyndham was the one. It wasn't so cosy after all. It was civilised on the service, but underneath there was savagery. And that's the thing about Britain and the British and the English. You know, there is this stiff upper lip and a trembling lower one, as Alder says, but behind that there's steel. And that's what makes this book interesting. It's manners, it's character, it's nationality. And at the same time, it's saying, let's question all these things. Absolutely magnificent. There you go, window. Now we're in the top three and this, this is hard. I, I think these are my top three and this is where things get a bit flaky. And the next writer, he's somebody who emerged as a science fiction writer from 1955 onwards. He grew up in China. He was British. He was born in China. He was interned in a prisoner of war camp when he was a young boy, um, which he saw as an adventure um, some of the time. And sometimes it was deprivation. He didn't come to Britain, his native country, until he was virtually a teenager. And it, the greyness and everything just really affected him. And it sparked something in his head and his experiences in, in the Japanese prisoner war camp in China when he was young, really created the symbolism which came out of his work. And he began his career in terms of novels with a tetralogy of disaster stories like Wyndham's, except the difference was, was the characters in this guy's disaster stories would psychologically embrace the collapses. They, would, they wouldn't fight against them. They'd go with the flow. And we talk about J.G. Ballard and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting thing. It's very, very hard because the book I've chosen by him, a lot of people would say isn't a science fiction novel. And I'd even say that myself. But what Ballard did in the early 60s, he said, Earth is the only alien planet and we need to look at inner space, not outer space and leave the space fantasies behind. And he was at the forefront of the new wave in this. He was a writer who you know, he was more, reading Ballard was more like reading Calvino or Borges or one of the great European modernists, Camus or Sartre or what have you. And he was a stylist, very dry style. He sort of had a painter's eye rather than a poet's ear, as David Pringle said. His, David is his archivist. And I cho chose this book, which is one of the most controversial books um, ever. It's one of my favourite books. I think it's magnificent. I think it's note perfect. And that is Crash. This is the Jonathan Cape first edition of Crash UK. And I'm very, very proud of this. And Crash is a book which changed science fiction. In the 1970s, Ballard did a thematic trilogy, which I call the Urban Trilogy, which comprised Crash, High Rise and Concrete Island. And they're not really science fiction because they don't have a novum. They don't have a technological thing which doesn't exist in our world. It's about things which already exist. And then this is the motor car. However, what Ballard did was that in his statement about inner space and the idea that your consciousness 
was being changed by technology and by the media landscape. That's rather like the paradigm shift of SF. So what Ballard did was he helped tear the fabric of the curtain between the mainstream and the ghetto of SF asunder and he allowed science fiction tropes and ideas to leak through into the mainstream and infect them. And if you look at all sorts of writers who were sort of popular in the last 20, 30 years, who were claimed as literary writers uh, and avant-garde. They nearly all show the influence of Ballard. They all show the influence of New Wave SF. And Crash, very strange book. It was the first Ballard novel I read. And I think really that colored my view of everything he wrote. And it is my favorite one. And I do think it's the best one. And it's about a man called Ballard, which is very rele revelatory, who is in a car crash and in the car crash, a person in the other car is killed, but their wife survives. He finds that he has become obsessed with this car crash and its erotic implications. And he becomes part of a small underground of characters who bond together over the poetry and violence and eroticism of the crashed car. And it's about our obsession with the car in the 20th and 21st century and how it's changed our consciousness and how it's allowed our bodies to move rapidly through space and how it's changed our minds. So it's science fiction in the sense that it's about how technology merges with human consciousness. And that's what's really important about it. It's very stylish and shiny and magnificent. It's very difficult and strange. Um, you know, I think a publisher's reader read it and said, you know, the, the author of this book is beyond psychological help. And Ballard himself said he thought that was perfect. That was what he was aiming for. It is very jarring and very unusual, but it's also very beautiful. The way it's written, the iconography, the way that cars and their wrecks are described, the way that the characters' inner landscapes is explored. And the characters are just wonderful. There's a character called Vaughan, who is a hoodlum scientist, who is based on Ballard's friend, Dr. Christopher Evans, who is obsessed with traffic plans and car crashes. And he has a plan which will culminate at the end of the novel in which he may live or he may die. And it's really, really quite something. This is the very pinnacle of new wave science fiction. This is the pinpoint, the sharp end, where all the cozy sort of ideas about manifest destiny, the conquest of space, how we're superior to aliens, how all that just falls apart and the reality of the technophobic world that we're in, the horror of contemporary technology, what it's done to our minds and bodies is fully revealed in its glory and its pain and its misery and its sheer sterling cardinal architectural genius is there as well. So there we are. It has philosophy, it has sinew, there's a kind of harmony about the book. There's, t there's a tempest of detail. It's just sublime, crash, magnificent. I could talk about it all day, as you can see. We're coming on to the last two. And the next one is a book which is very personal to me. And I think it's a very, very important novel indeed. I think it's the best modern novel I've ever read. And since I read it, and I read it when it first came out in paperback. Um, so that would have been, I think, let's have a look. I'm just going to filter it under the table and have a look because I know roughly when it is. Yeah. So I read it in 1985 and I'd read several books by this writer before and I was a fan of his work, but this really changed my life as it changed my ideas about what you could do with fiction. It also changed my idea of what science fiction was because this writer was a science fiction writer right the way from the beginning of his career in 1966, right up until just before this book, I would say. And again, this is a book which may not be science fiction in the conventional sense, and it's exactly why you should read it. And that book is The Glamour by Christopher Priest. This is the Jonathan Cape World First Edition, first printing of The Glamour. And there's Chris there, and Chris is my favorite living writer. Best known as an SF writer for the novel Inverted World, which came out in 1975 and is often number two of every best books poll ever in France after Lord of the Rings. Um, but this is the glamour and it's interesting. The glamour has had four different editions and by that I mean four different textual variations. So this is the hardcover. The first one I read was this paperback. Um, that's the second edition, first printing of the glamour. So the text was altered between the hardcover and the paperback. 
So this is the first the first printing of the of the first paperback edition, but the second edition of the book, as I say, the content differs. And this is my preferred edition. So if you can get the Abacus one, briefly there was a A format edition. So an A format is like this. The okay, so it was a smaller format one was available on export for a few months in around about nineteen eighty seven. So as long as you see it with this cover, you've got the one with the text, which I believe is the best text, the finest text. And this for me was the culmination of Priest's work and the moment when he moved into something beyond SF and where he expanded the boundaries. This has an SF trope in it, a trope which, um, you know, we can attribute to H.G. Wells. It's an older trope than that, but Wells made it scientific and it's kind of in this. And this is the story of a journalist who is injured when he's a photojournalist and he's covering a, um, a butt. A, a bit of terrorist activity and he's injured when a bomb goes off and he's recuperating in a small country house you know a care, a care home and he's visited by a young woman who claims to have had a relationship with him and he's lost his memory and this is a book about subjectivity time identity memory and he is very keen to remember his relationship with this woman and he can't remember anything and something gradually comes back and it's loosely based on an experience priest had as a child when he fell off his bike bonked his head and he had retroactive amnesia for about three days so it's drawn from from experience as well and the central character of this is drawn by the woman into a strange twilight world into the world of the glamour which does have a scientific core to it this is not a hard science book it's about perception as i say and memory identity and it's absolutely amazing and this is a book in which everything changes with the very last letter of it and don't jump to it i can't say enough good about it it really made me realize what you could do with fiction and how the questions of subjectivity ontology what is real what isn't real that's a big thing in philip k dick well priest does this in a subtler cleverer and more affecting way and you know also if you like films like Memento by Christopher Nolan who later made a film of the prestige if you like sort of and the uncertainty of unreliable narrators and that kind of thing and there's not essentially unreliable narrators in this it's a different sort of thing you have to read this the glamour and this for me was the moment when it was the ultimate that new wave science fiction can do between crash and the glamour they'd reached the point where the line between the mainstream and SF was pulled away and the infection could seep in and of course what happened shortly after that was the new British space opera renaissance and things went back to the 1930s sad but true but really there was no further that anybody could go than with those two books except Priest kept going and Ballard kept going so there you go we come to number one well it's not really going to be a surprise to anybody actually I'll show you other editions of the glamour this is the third edition the Simon and Schuster one so that's the third variant text and the current edition which is the fourth variant text and next time I interview Chris which will be coming up soon I can ask him why he revised I think it's something to do with a play radio play version so there's four different texts so that's why um, I've got all those editions of the glamour and as I say it's one of my favorite books of all time finally we come to what is for me the ultimate science fiction novel the ultimate literary science fiction novel the ultimate world building novel the most important novel of our times a novel whose importance grows and grows and grows and grows so much so that it's a cliche to say it but you know a lot of cliches are true it's written with a wonderful direct clear window pane style that you can see through and everything is implied or stated it's all done with economy and with style and with fur and it just is magnificent and I'm talking about one of the most famous books in the world a book which I think back in the I think it was back in the 90s um, a book selling company I worked for did like a vote and Channel 4 were involved as well with the books of the century and this came in at number two after Lord of the Rings and we're talking about George Orwell's 1984 this is the facsimile edition published in 1984 um, by Secker and Warburg. This was £25, as you see, it's huge. And this was remaindered. I paid five quid for it. And what this does, this shows you the actual manuscript that was extant. Only some of it was extant. It was found in a barn somewhere, believe it or not. So you can read um, what Orwell actually wrote, what he crossed out as he wrote this magnificent volume. Now, 
there is a video on the channel about 1984 as science fiction because a lot of people don't recognize her as science fiction. There is a wonderful edition published in Golag's Masterworks with a great introduction by Ian Dent. I'm just going to recount the setting briefly. 1950s, there is a limited nuclear war. It's limited because the powers that be realize that it can't go on. There are street revolutions in different parts of the world. And from this, three new nation super states emerge. Oceania, which is the Americas, Australasia, South Africa, and Britain. Eurasia, which is continental Europe, Russia, and the Soviet part of Russia, right the way over to Vladivostok. East Asia, which goes from the top of China down to the south of India. And then there's an area where there is always fighting, Africa, the Middle East. That's where the wars are fought. The three super states are pretty much identical. They have the same totalitarian ideology, except it's called different things. In Oceania, it's called Ingsoc, English Socialism. And in Oceania, language is being changed into something called Newspeak, so that people can only narrowly express their modes of thought. It's all about orthodoxy. And this is the most important thing about 1984. Newspeak will limit what you can say so that you cannot say anything that, that is politically incorrect. Think about that in the context of today's world. If you speak Newspeak, you stick to the Newspeak dictionary, which is destroying words, then you cannot say anything politically incorrect. Okay. And that's the most important thing. So that shows you the significance of linguistics in SF and how the manipulation of language through mass media and through indoctrination is a really important thing and how political SF is probably the most important SF of all. Inner space. In this world, we see Winston Smith. The book is set in 1984 and he works for the Ministry of Truth where he rewrites the past to fit in with the party's ideology and he hates it and he wants to rebel. 1984 is full of science fiction symbolism, of floating fortresses, of discussion of mirrors in space, of brainwashing, electroshock therapy, strange injections which change your mind about things, two and two making five, people wearing uniforms, attending the two minutes hate where they worship a leader who's rather like Kim Jong-un or Joe Stalin or something like that. It really does reflect the modern world and 1984 was intended as a warning. It's become cliche to say, well, 1984 was actually about the way Britain was in 1948. And yes, we know that, but it was more to it than that. It was about a vision of the future with a boot stamping on a human face forever. And whenever I read 1984, I've read it dozens of times. I still get something out of it. There's so much in it. It's so rich. It's the thought police and their leather uniforms. You know, it's, it's redolent of all kinds of imagery. You could talk about it for days and days and days. And you see the kind of things, the kind of oppression of freedom of thought and freedom of expression every day in our society. And you see it both on left and right and the middle. So it's a profoundly important book. But I would say the most important thing about it is Newspeak. So this is my critical edition of 1984. And if you've never read it, you must read it. It's easier to understand it in its context and its date if you're a bit older, but you will see all sorts of metaphors for what's happening in the real world. And that's why it's so important because the best science fiction is always metaphoric. It's always about our world now. And to think that it was, this was written 1948, 1949, published 1950, Orwell died soon afterwards. He didn't intend it to be his last book. It just ended up being his last book. It's also the third of a trilogy, a thematic trilogy, which begins with Coming Up For Air, continues with Animal Farm and culminates in 1984. Never by an edition that has 1984 on the cover because that's Newspeak. 1984 is not the title. The title is 1984. And that was deliberate because he wants you to have the weight and beauty of language rather than just a number, an abbreviation. And, you know, Orwell, was the greatest pro stylist, really clear. Young people still love reading Orwell now. He's a magnificent essayist, com um, commentator. He was left wing, but critical of the left and a great social novelist and very witty as well. Great satire as well, 1984. So that's my top 25 SF novels, my best SF novels. 
maybe it'll change maybe something newer will come into it but that's where I am today with the 25 best I hope you enjoyed it I'm sure you'll have read many of them some you won't have read um, I'd love to know your thoughts I'm sure you'll be saying well I think this should have been whatever well that's all very well and good but this is the best and it's a subjective measure I'm happy to hear yours you'll notice an absence of pretty much all of the big four you'll notice an absence of lots of traditional things I'm more the literary SF there is lots of canonical canonical books in here but I'm really interested in the quality of writing in SF as well as the way that it punches through into a new reality this is Outlook Bookseller signing out for now